trying to happen as the summer approaches. I know Ken's got several announcements of the year and keeping our kids in prayer, CIY, and all kinds of things. So we have PBS and all that, and Ken will put in on the details if he gives his announcements as always. Um, we are very blessed every day to have the health we have to wake up and, and enjoy the day that we are given to live. And uh, this morning, we always put it so uh, clearly when it, the call that we have to tell people about Christ. Uh, life is short. And uh, we have a responsibility, every opportunity we have, to tell people about who Jesus is and, and what he means to us. And I hope we, we take advantage of that every opportunity. And uh, if you're visiting this morning, what a blessing to have you. We're so happy to have you here with us and, and uh, hope that you'll be blessed by our services as we continue throughout this morning. Um, it's always good to start out with some blessing. Um, I know every year we give to Camp Dovetail, which is the, the, the work that they do there. And uh, I know we're very... Uh, happy to be able to help them, and uh, they of course have given us a plaque uh, that we received, I think for several years now we've received this, and we appreciate it, uh, I don't know how many years, uh, but uh, Foundation Fellows present New Hampshire to Christ in recognition of your generous contribution to SAF, and its continued commitment to our children with special needs in our region 2011-12, and that's been presented to us by their board of trustees, and we're very happy to help them, and uh, we'll continue that help next week. Uh, with a love offering that will be taken up for the uh, cookies for Camp Dovetail. Every year we do that, and uh, we just appreciate the job they do. So uh, we're, we're very happy to help them, so uh, glad that that's going well. Person-to-person uh, -person ministries, I know they have a lot going on. Uh, their spring clinic, May the 15th and 17th at uh, Restoration Acres, which is kind of uh, several classes, several different speakers. Uh, we're going to have the pamphlet, the form. Uh, well, I guess it's a pamphlet slash form. But anyway, we'll have it out there. And then uh, May 7th and 9th, uh, their work days. So if you can help out in any way, we'll post that as well. Uh, everybody, let's have a little exercise. Hold your bulletin up. All right. Uh, if you check uh, your announcements in the bulletin, it says something today about uh, Busy Bees meeting following service. Well, that was last week for the ladies. Uh, so we'll type, well, that's all right. Uh, if you want to show up and sit, you can. I don't know. Uh, so... Uh, I told told you all, of course, most of you probably forgot about that meeting. Any, I'm teasing. That's bad. I'm joking. Get free the bulletin. Just a joke. Just a joke. Check the bulletin. Just teasing. But there is no meeting today. That was last week. So keep that in mind. And uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the front. Shirley, is that May the 8th? And that is 6.30? Yes. And that is the busy piece. And what is, what is the... Uh, Fashion show for the kids, so something the ladies are putting together. If you plan on attending that, ladies, bring your children, but the sign-up sheet is there in the front, and they would like to know how many will be attending at that time. Uh, 65 for Sunday school, so that was, uh, we need to get in the 70s. I hope we can do that as the summer approaches, but we definitely should try to do that. If you're not uh, having anything going between 9.30 and 10.30, we'd love to have it. It's a good time of Bible study, but we need to be fed during the week, and that's an opportunity to do so. Uh, and we appreciate all of our Sunday school teachers from old to young and the, and the work they do and the lessons they prepare. Um, so we're very blessed. As, as we go to the Lord in prayer, we want to be mindful of the list of needs and concerns. Um, and, and, and Eddie Mount, who is uh, Lisa Vitro's uh, sister-in-law, um, had, had just uh, uh, suffered from a stroke uh, and is at the hospital for rehab. Uh, they think it's possibly stress-related. And uh, we want to definitely keep her in our prayers. Leroy Keir, uh, who's been attending with us, uh, was rushed to the hospital yesterday morning, having some pain in his chest. It was pain starting by his, uh, in his head, went through his arm. Uh, they released him this morning. Jane called uh, the church a little earlier today. But we need to keep Leroy in our prayers. He's been cancer-free for a year and a half. Uh, but they just recently uh, found that it is through his liver and his lungs. Uh, so uh, we need to definitely keep uh, him in our prayers as he prepares again for a long uh, road when we think of chemo. And we know also Kathy Williams, what she's going through as well, so we always want to remember her. Eldon, good to have you with us this morning. Uh, this Thursday, having knee replacement. So they're going to make him stronger, faster. That's only major show. Can I get that? <laughs> I've got to get your references. I do. Uh, but we want to keep you in our prayers. We're, we're glad you had a safe trip to Cleveland this week, and we want to remember you Thursday. As well, and, and the others, uh, prayer list needs and concerns. And uh, as we go to the Lord in prayer, let's be mindful of these and uh, the opportunity we have together this morning to just come together and worship God. So, so join me in prayer. Father, we are so very blessed for this day, this time to gather together as believers and um, have an open heart and mind as we prepare for your word. Uh, may we not 
just be prepared to listen this morning, but uh, when we leave the doors, we be prepared to apply to our lives. That every opportunity we have, we tell people about you, because we know life is precious, and there is no greater decision any man or woman can make than whether or not they've accepted you as their Lord and Savior. So, Father, as we gather together, I pray that you will just bless our time of service. We think of the upcoming activities and events that the church has prepared. I pray that we uh, work together. We all have a place, and we all get plugged in and serve, and know that's when we can do great things for you. That whatever we decide, uh, and whatever we plan, may we be prayerful and thoughtful, and that we seek to bring glory to your name. Bless the names mentioned this morning on the prayer list and needs and concerns, whether it's those who are getting ready to undergo treatment, those battling illness or, or health complications, even unspoken requests. Father, you are a mighty God, and you are greater than anything we presently face. Let your hand be upon them. Bless them and their families at this time. And Father, we love you. We thank you for your son's sacrifice on the cross, That know, to know that no matter what happens uh, as we live on this earth, we know what awaits us eternally. And for that, Father, we love you. And in all your people's, uh, and, and, and just in your precious name, we all pray. I can't talk this morning. I don't know what is. I didn't have. I just have one cup of coffee apparently, so that's going to fix that. And then real quick, I'm, uh, Austin Palmer is our only uh, so far senior out of this class graduating, right? which is a shock that he's graduating. We're very happy about that. <laughs> and, uh, and he's invited all of you to attend his high school graduation May the 27th at 2 p.m. A dessert reception will be held May the 28th, 2 to 5. Directions. RSVP by, by May the 20th, and you can see Austin's picture here, and uh, they had to Photoshop. Uh, he's a lot scrawnier than this. I think that's a different body. So. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. So congratulations. Uh, that'll be posted as well. Again, you're up, sir. Good morning. Um, fruit juice. We still need bottles of 100% fruit juice. Keep bringing those in. Um, the camp, we try to get at least 55 bottles. We've got nine right now, so get those brought in. We need them in here by May 27th so we can get them delivered down to camp. Vacation Bible School, there will be a meeting for anybody interested in helping out. Next Sunday, right after church, will be a very quick meeting. But if on your bulletin, there's a list on the back of things that you can go ahead and start bringing in if you'd like to help. Um, we need like little cups of mixed fruit, um, applesauce, things of jello, anything like that, you can bring that in. The Stouffer's frozen macaroni and cheese, uh, bring that into the freezer. Uh, chicken nuggets and hot dogs, hot dog buns. We can get all that as much as we can. Go ahead and start bringing that stuff in and we'll store that because we'll be using that for snack time and for their food. So remember that next Sunday, also immediately after the BBS meeting, the senior high class will be going out for lunch for Austin's graduation. Have a short little um, party for them, eating out with them. So any senior high kids, encourage you to get out with that. Um, other than that, that's about all I've got. Junior church kids, come on up. How many of you like to run? <coughs> Running can be fun. A lot of you like to run real quick. Just in short little verse, you know, like maybe you're running to school, well, maybe running out of school, probably not to school, um, running to a friend's house to play. Some people like to run for miles. Do you like to run for miles and miles and miles and just run all the time? You know, there's a marathon that's 26 miles. Imagine running 26 miles. After 26 miles, I want a nap. That would be about the only thing I could think about. Now, actually, if I could just finish, I would be happy. You know, some people, they win the marathon, and they have all these parties and have a big celebration for him. You know, for other runners like me, just being able to finish the race is reward enough. Because I don't run that much. And, you know, life can be like that race, too. For some of us, just being able to finish is good because we're not always going to win at life. There's going to be times that we do things that we know we shouldn't have done. And we kind of didn't do what God really wanted us to do there. But you know what? We have to keep going. We have to have friends that are going to encourage us. And if we keep going and continue, and it's a thing called endurance where you don't never give up. You just keep going and going and going. 
then you're going to get a big reward. And I want to look at Colossians 1, 12 through 14. And it says, it says, being strengthened with all power according to the glory of might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of the, in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of the darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. There's five things just in those verses that Paul lists that if we continue and endure, that we've got these benefits coming to us. The first one is that he made us qualified and shared his inheritance. That means someday we're going to be able to live with God. We're going to, when we die, we're going to be able to go to heaven and to stay with him. He rescued us from Satan's dominion over darkness. And he made us his children. So the devil has no power over us again. You know, we've been rescued from that. The third, he brought us into his eternal kingdom. I mean, we have eternal life with him. Fourth, he's redeemed us. He bought our freedom from sin and judgment through Christ's blood. We've been redeemed. And then he forgives us of all our sins. So even though sometimes we feel like a runner who is just tired and he's ready to quit and we just want to give up, don't. Never give up because there is a lot of benefits waiting for those of us to continue and finish the race. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the strength you've given us. We thank you for helping us to be able to endure and just continue to go out and to live for you. Lord, we ask that you be with us throughout the rest of this day, that all that we do and say would be glorifying you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
start out this morning, or uh, service, but use page 571, <coughs> verse in the fifth verse of 571.
lift them up and put them in your hands and pray that you would just comfort them during this time. Lord, we thank you for being a God that is so awesome and that is always there for us and that knows our needs and will supply with those needs. Lord, we lift up the military men and women that are out there fighting for our safety and our freedoms and we just pray for their safety and just put them in your hands and we pray for their families that are back here and pray that you would come to them and give them strength. Lord, we pray for the leaders of this country, for the, even local leaders, and that you just give them the wisdom that they need to govern the way that you would want us to be governed. Lord, we just thank you again for this day, for another day of life that we serve you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. For our time of communion, we'll be using 349. <laughs> Yeah. 
tenth chapter, the first and second verses we read. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers and put fire in them and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. <coughs> so fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. They died before the Lord. Can you imagine how shocked the people must have been that fire consumed these two young priests in their worship service? What would we do today if these plates were being passed and fire jumped out of one of those plates and consumed someone? We won't become very alert real quick, would we? You know, I think that. Place, all for a place to make a record time going around this, this room this, this morning. Well, the question is in this what was the problem with Nathan and Bayou's offering? You just have to go back to the first verse again and read. There are sons, Nathan and Bayou, took their censors put fire in them and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. But uh, breaking the rules that they were actually showing contempt for God, their actions that they, they took that day. In New Testament times, we don't have the same rules governing our offering. God grants us great freedom as we bring our offerings. We're free to decide how much we're going to give. Uh, there are a great number of offerings in the Old Testament times. There were bird offerings, grain offerings, fellowship offerings, sin offerings, joint offerings, uh, a lot of different offerings that they, they were required to bring at certain times. But we stop and think that although the rules of the offering have changed since they have in five years' time, God has not changed. He's the same awesome being who demands and deserves our respect. <coughs> the offering is an important part of our service. It's the same as the communion. Preaching, prayer, singing praises, are all part of our service. The offering is a very important part also. It's a way we express our honor and our faith in God. You know, sometimes uh, it's easier to bring our money than it is ourselves to God. Paul said he uh, praised the Macedonian Christians. Because what did they do? They gave them themselves first before they gave their offering. They raised them for that. We must offer to God the proper things, just as Nadab and the Bible needed to do. So, give more. This is, I say, be sure to give more than your money today. Show respect. Show your submission to God to your offering. It's a way that we can so show that to God. So, <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of offering that we can come and bring what you blessed us with and we return to you. And Father, we realize that truly it's sometimes easier to offer our money than it is ourselves. And Father, we pray that We'll offer ourselves to you and what you and the portion of what you blessed us with to give you the honor and the praise and the glory of always. Thank you that you provided all things for us. May we use them properly. May we respect you, knowing that truly you are a great and awesome God. Thank you, Father, for loving us and providing for us and caring for us. These things we pray in Jesus' name.
crowd will be bringing our message from. Good morning, everyone. As Ken uh, mentioned, Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11 is what we're going to be looking at this morning. And, and let's just start and, and dive into this passage and, and, and join together in a word of prayer to, to prepare ourselves for the message God, God has for us this morning. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 5, we, we read, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart, that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, was it the money at your disposal? What did you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out, and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear had seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Dear Lord, we read this passage in Acts 5 this morning as we prepare for your message. We realize the importance of being honest with you in our giving. And not just giving, because we know that is just a branch of our service to you. What we're called to be as servants of the Lord. So Father, this morning I pray that as we evaluate in our own hearts how we've given to you, what we've been giving to you, may we truly be honest and know that we cannot lie to you. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Have you ever watched poker? I, I don't play poker, but one of my things in life, a bucket list perhaps, is to be at a poker table and go all in. <laughs> and I don't care if it's like a two and a three. I don't care. I just want to go just to say that and be like Bond, you know, all in. You know? And uh, that's why I don't you know, gamble at all. I, I lose my money. But no, you, you know, the, just the, the idea of, 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 you know, just having that kind of moment, and you're sitting at that table, and it can be a pretty intimidating thing. I know today it's televised. It's a pretty popular thing. But when you have a good hand, you don't want to tell someone, you know. Uh, you don't, what well, they call it, a poker tell, right? You, you want to play your cards correctly. But some players end up in a hand that is pretty crummy. So they begin to bluff their way through that hand to give the appearance uh, of having something a lot better than they're actually holding. Sometimes this works. But if you're around people, and not just poker, but life, you can, you can tell when they're bluffing. They have nervous tics sometimes. Maybe it's not giving you eye contact. Maybe it's the twitching of the finger, the tapping on the table. Something is showing that, that nothing's, something's quite off. Maybe they're bluffing with maybe how their day is going, or how their marriage is, or, or, or what's going on in their personal life. But in the game of poker, you begin to tell when someone's bluffing that their hand isn't as good as they intend it to be. Well, I believe this morning there are many Christians who are bluffing their way through life concerning how they've been giving to God. Now, the first thing you hear about giving, you automatically think, oh my goodness, he's preaching a sermon on offering. But I think it's much more than just the plate being passed and how much we put in there. It's how we do it. Where our heart is when we give to God. What we really have been giving to Him. What are we holding back from Him? And, and we are honest with our Lord because He knows our hearts to begin with. I love Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. Every one of us in this church. And this church as a whole, concerning what God has given it and how it has prospered, we all must be honest, truly, with our giving to the Lord. Because you can't bluff God. I don't care how uh, well you may fool the people around you and think that your appearance is fine. You cannot bluff your way through life trying to think that you can fool God. He knows our hearts. He sees our real motives. He reads right through hypocrisy and 
and insincerity, especially concerning Christianity and the way we live our lives. We read Acts 5 and we see Ananias and Sapphira, this married couple, try to bluff their way and they're giving to God and it fails miserably. You cannot lie to God. As we see here, the consequences are pretty grave because God is always going to call our blood. In Acts 5, we kind of get a background of this passage. And, and I want you to remember that the original manuscript, there was no chapter divisions. So when we read Acts 5, you probably would be better to start in chapter 4, verse 32, because it begins with the liberality of the early church. Because it says, all the believers were in one heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. But they shared everything they had. And you read on, you see the, the liberality, the generosity of the early Christians. And the love they had. That was one of the reasons why the church grew so much. They had such a heart for the Lord. The way they did was heartfelt and genuine. It was true gen generosity. But then we fast forward to chapter 5. And we read this married couple, Ananias and Sapphira. And they kind of pick up on, on this generosity. But they think uh, it would be pretty nice if some people patted us on the back for a change. About what we did. Uh, the praise of men is a very enticing thing. When you do something good and you don't expect it and someone tells you how good of a job you did, it's hard not to feel a little inflated in the ego, you know, or, or at least puffed up because you think, yeah, I did a pretty good job. That's how someone recognized that. Or, or plaques or awards or recognition. It is an enticing thing. And it swells the pride that is hiding within us. One of Satan's favorite uh, weapons is the praise of men because it feels good to be complimented, doesn't it? For Ananias and Sapphira, it seemed that they wanted to kind of counterfeit the generosity found in Acts chapter 4. And it's interesting because notice in ch chapter 4, verse 36, we see a man by the name of Barnabas. And it says, Joseph, the Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles named Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Barnabas would be a popular name throughout the early church, one of Paul's missionary companions. As, as he went about it and spread the word and evangelism. But it says he sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Pretty generous. Spontaneous giving. No strings attached. Barnabas was not looking for the praise of men. He just was compelled with the liberality that was taking place in his heart to know, I want to give and be a part of this because I want the Lord to do what's best with this money. May the church spread and grow. That was the heart that Barnabas had. However, we see the opposite of that. And the motives of this married couple in Ananias and Sapphira. From this passage, we see God's attitude toward dishonesty in our individual lives. I love J.W. McGarvey and his commentary on Acts. And, and, and I love what he writes concerning this passage. He says, unfortunately for our race, every excellence in human character has its counterfeits. And the praise lavished on men of real benevolence prompts others at times to play hypocrite by pretending to be more benevolent than they are. In the Greek, the word hypocrite, hypocrite is, is play acting. Um, the actors during the time of, of, of Greece plays would have a mask that meant uh, whether you were sad or, or happy, and I think we touched on that in, in some sermons in the past. But the idea is you're pretending to be something you are not. The biggest excuse people have as to why they do not attend church is because that church is full of hypocrites. You hear it all the time, right? But when we do not genuinely live out the faith we profess to have, they have every right to call us hypocrites. But especially when we think of in terms of what and how we give to God. This couple wanted to counterfeit this generosity. We don't know a lot about Ananias and Sapphira, say this passage. I think it's interesting. Ananias' name means Jehovah gives graciously. Uh, and then Sapphira's name means beautiful or jewel. What is funny about this passage is that there was nothing gracious or beautiful about the motives they had concerning why they were giving in the first place. This married couple was in complete agreement concerning this scheme. You know, behind every good man there's a good woman. Behind sometimes bad men there may be an equally bad and worse woman. I don't know if that's always true. But we see in this case, not just one spouse, but both were in agreement that they thought it's about time we get our name in the paper, so to speak. John W. Wade writes, in many a marriage, one partner has been dissuaded from a vile deed by the other, but neither partner had any reservations about carrying out this plot. Tragic indeed is the household in which there is no restraining voice of decency or honesty. Starting next Sunday, and for six weeks, we're going to really focus on marriage and the way God intended it to be, and I encourage you to come and be a part of that on Sunday mornings with us. 
But it's bad enough when, as a, as a mother or father, your spouse does not give you support in coming to church or living out your faith. That's hard when raising your children. Now, double that and look at both spouses and you think that the situation that, that the ch children are in or the family's in, it makes things doubly worse that Satan has a stranglehold on that household and that family because both parents are seeking to be dishonest and get ahead in some way. It is so important to parents that not only in your marriage that children see the love you have for each other, but that you both worship God together and be a part of that faith together and grow together. If not, Satan is going to have an opportunity to get his foot within that relationship and really do some damage. Man, no matter how hard he may try, cannot counterfeit true generosity in the name of the Lord. We try, and we think still by some way that, that though, you know, we know we're saved by grace through faith in Christ, but somehow our good deeds matter in that. And we're able to pat ourselves on the back and think, I'm a part of this. I've done this pretty good deed. God's surely going to recognize this. And, and other people will recognize this and know that, that the church is able to grow because I did this. Or, or they were able to, to do this activity because I chipped in it. I was a part of it. And I want to make sure my name is recognized. But if it's true generosity in the name of the Lord, I want you to know this morning, as servants of Jesus Christ, more often than not, when you serve the Lord, it's going to go unnoticed. Because we serve a mighty God in Jesus Christ who set the example for us in his servanthood. And there are many a times where what he did went unnoticed and even his own family rejected who he was. We do not serve the Lord for name recognition. We serve the Lord because he has saved us by his wonderful grace. That is the motive we have to serve. And what we give is just an offspring of the way we live our lives for him. It's important to understand that. In Acts chapter 5 we see this couple trying to counterfeit generosity. And God deals with their hypocrisy and their insincerity. And we, today, as we learn from this passage, need to be honest with God because he will always call our beloved. There's three things this morning I want us to find from this passage together as we look at this example of Ananias and Sapphira, the tragedy that takes place. And uh, the first thing is this. True generosity is free from hypocrisy. True generosity and what we give and how we give is free from hypocrisy. There's no strings attached. There's no ulterior motive. We give because God calls us to. And we give so that glory may be brought to God's name and his kingdom furthered. Ananias and Sapphira wanted to copycat Barnabas' giving. When he, he comes forward, he sells his piece of property and he lays it before the apostles' feet. Well, they thought, I've got an ingenious idea. Let's do the same thing. But the reason they claimed on giving was far different than Barnabas's. Many Christians today do the same thing. Many Christians today claim to be generous givers all the while they are hiding what they really have. They are hiding what they really can give. There are many churches today who do the same thing. Though generosity is there, whether they're sitting on money or whether they're hiding what they have, they're not being honest with what they really can do for the Lord. And this church and every other church must be honest with themselves and evaluate that concerning our giving to the Lord. So Ananias and Sapphira wanted to copy Barnabas' giving. And understand that just giving the appearance of generosity is his hypocrisy. You can't play Christian. You can't play generosity. God reads right through it. Notice verse 2, and there's an interesting uh, a phrase there. It says, with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money and the property that they sold. And with his wife's full knowledge, I know that when you read Genesis 2, Adam gets the bad rap. I know men want to blame the woman first, but women are like, no, no, Adam was done up too. Well, this is a case, guys, though it's bad. We're reading things, well, women, you're not so bright either because you did the same thing. You read <laughs> this passage, and Sapphira shows up unknowingly, and then boom, same thing happens to her, but we'll get to that in just a moment. I'm just teasing. We're trying to be equal here. You know, women and men are just, don't want to, sorry. So, it says here, kept back. Now, the word surreptitiously comes to mind, or deceitfully. Uh, but in the middle voice of the Greek, it denotes that this action was done very selfishly. They were keeping back in their giving to God. Both agreed to sell a piece of their property. They were going to turn the proceeds over to the apostles, just as Barnabas did, while keeping back part of the money and pretending all the while to donate all of it. The idea that they don't know my full bank account, they don't know how much the property actually was, they're going to think that we sold all of it. You can't deceive God. Ananias lays the money before the apostles' feet, much like Barnabas did. I mean, he was probably to a T, thinking, I'm going to do this, and just as they praised Barnabas and they thought he was a great guy, they're going to think I'm pretty great. And they're going to start recognizing me. 
When you seek the praise of men, be careful the path that leads you down. When you serve because you want to be recognized, be careful where that leads you in life. Because it draws you further from Christ than you would think it would be. It takes you away from the true motive of servanthood to begin with. Hold your place and turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. It's interesting because the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira, this disgenuous giving, this dishonest giving, parallel what the Pharisees did. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And notice what Christ tells us about the Pharisees. He says this, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you get to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues or on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you get to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. When you give to be recognized by men, you receive your reward already. But understand, you will deal with that with God on His own time and on His own space. God will deal with that. That, that false motive, that hidden agenda in serving the Lord. That somehow in giving in His name, we receive recognition. A true servant of Jesus Christ gives so that God receives recognition. That God is praised. That God is glorified. The Pharisees wanted to be seen. And as the offering plate was passed, they wanted uh, the change to jingle as they dropped it in so that people would know how holy and pious they were. But God saw right through that hypocrisy. Many people today focus on what they've been giving and they're pretty proud. But sometimes we just need to sometimes evaluate how we've been giving. And if you're giving in an honest manner, then, then keep it up. But we all need to do some moral inventory. Just keep ourselves morally in check with God and just make sure that we have the right motives and that we're giving with a whole heart so that Satan doesn't have an opportunity to work in our lives. Not just individually, but the church as well. This church has been blessed greatly by God. There is no denying that. But understand, we know that there's going to have to be things that need to be done around here. And we can't sit around and wish it together. Sometimes money has to be spent. And no one's telling the church to empty their coffers and just, you know, give everything and expect God to do something. When we plan on something or prepare, we need to be prayerful about it. We need to make sure God's a part of it and He's first and foremost. And, and we seek Him so that what we're doing is pleasing to Him. But understand, we have to evaluate sometimes when we say we don't have money, maybe we're just sitting on it. What can we really be giving to God? We need to evaluate it individually and the church as a whole. Because a true servant of Jesus Christ gives generously without any hidden motives. Can you think what Ananias what was going through his mind when he came forward? He's like, ah, yes, finally, look at me. Uh, look at me, everyone. Now I'm the center of attention. Uh, my name is Ananias. There's A-N-A-N-I-A-S. If you do not know that, uh, I wanted everyone to understand who I am in this uh, you know, worship service. Please, everyone, direct your attention to me. But understand, a true servant of Jesus Christ gives to bring God glory. Not selfishly, but we're called to give selflessly. Because I guarantee you this morning, if we're not honest in what we put in that offering plate, we're probably not honest in a whole lot of other areas we're supposed to be serving the Lord. That is just a branch of the way we live our life. We follow after the example of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in Mark 10, 45. It says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but He came to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. No strings attached with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and how He gave us. So here is Ananias. He comes forward, and the apostles are gathered together. Peter's here, and he's probably expecting a much different response than the one Peter gives. You see, not only is true generosity free from hypocrisy, but that leads us to our second point this morning. And that is hypocrisy is always linked to insincerity. Hypocrisy is always linked to insincerity or being dishonest. When we are not really honest in our giving, whether it is what we give or how we give, 
how much we have or what we're holding back, then in essence, understand this, we are lying to God. You may not want to acknowledge that this morning, but that is true from this passage that when we hold back from God and we are not honest in the way we give to Him, we are lying to God. Let that sit for a second. The idea of a lie to our Heavenly Father. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. There's nothing you can do under the table that He doesn't see. There's nothing you can do outside the church door that He doesn't pick up on. And He knows every one of our hearts this morning and our motives and our thoughts. And serving and giving with the wrong motives, as we mentioned, opens the door for Satan to work in our lives. John Roberts this morning, in his offering meditation, I didn't even talk with him. He was made to have an abide And when we give, contrary to what God's Word says, the results are damaging. The results are devastating. Good does not come from that. Verse 3, notice Acts chapter 5, and notice what Peter says. Peter told Ananias this, How is it that Satan has filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? Many try to deceive God today, and they fail to do so. Peter knew about Ananias and Sapphira. Oh, he was an apostle, and I'm pretty sure he had the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he saw right through the charade that was taking place. I want you to know this. God is not fooled this morning by how you give or, or, or your giving in general. And, and he's not fooled over a period of time. But also know this. Over a period of time, people that you're around, they are going to begin to see through the way you are. The real you will come out. Your motives will appear to man. And over a period of time, they're going to pick up on the real you. So you can imagine Ananias deflated a little bit. Getting this response from Peter. But God can read right through the insincerity of his people. In Luke chapter 16, verse 15, Christ, again, in referencing the Pharisees and preaching to his disciples and the people gathered, says this, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. Many people give generously with the idea of feeling justified before the people around them, and somehow that gives them a sense of security, but it is a false sense of security because you still have to deal with why your heart truly isn't devoted to God. Christianity is an individual thing. It is myself and God. It is you and God. It is not your congregational members. It is not the people you sit with every week at church. It is not your family or friends. Every one of us gives an account of our own hearts to God without excuses. We have no excuses at all when we stand before God as to the way we live life for Him. There's no blaming someone else or, 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 or the appearance that was around you. It is an individual basis. And giving is very important when it comes to how we serve God. Peter emphasizes the point again in verse 4 by saying, You have not lied to men, but to God. The deception Ananias tried to get away with was to keep part of the sale price while pretending to give it all away. And there's just a couple, uh, three things that jump out to me from that verse when he says, Do not lie to men, but to God. Yes, you lie to men because you're trying to give off an appearance of someone you're not. You're trying to bluff your way through a, a Christian life. But the first is this, when we do not examine our motives, just as we said earlier, Satan will always attack our weaknesses. When we come before that communion table, and we examine ourselves, as Paul says in Corinthians, we examine our hearts, not only to see how we've lived this week, what have we done that is displeasing to God, and the sins we struggle with, but we examine so that our mind is focused, our heart is right, so that we know Satan is on the prowl. And when a church only cares about show, when people think that, look at me, I'm pretty good, I come every week, I give regularly, I'm something. Oh, Satan loves that. Satan loves to work when it comes to pride. Another thing we see here is that when he says you lie to the Holy Spirit, we know another verse. Though the Trinity, that word is not in Scripture, we know that there's the three in one God. And God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and there are many passages throughout the New Testament, and even when we go back to Genesis, when he says, let us make man in our image, to declare the deity of the Holy Spirit, that he is not some ghostly being, that he's not some spirit, it is God, the 
the Spirit. He is the very presence of God when we come out of that baptismal water. He enters our lives. And, and when we are doing something we should be doing, behaving in a way that is unbecoming as a Christian, understand, I like to think of it as we're exposing God to that. <clears throat> His presence in our lives. But well, what's really interesting about this, Ananias wasn't compelled by anyone to give this money to begin with. That's why Peter says, listen, you sold this piece of property. It was your money. You can get what you wanted to. There was nobody twisting Barnabas' arm when it comes to, to being compelled to give. In Acts chapter 4, he gave generously. Nobody compelled Ananias to give that much. He could have been honest and says, yeah, you can't that part of it, but we wanted to give something to you. I think God would have been perfectly fine with that. Again, God, you can't bluff him. And if you want to be generous in life, Understand that true generosity is not rehearsed and is spontaneous. Now listen, when I say rehearsed, there are some things that the church has to pray for when it comes to what we give. Absolutely. But I'm talking about on a, on a basis where it is us and God, how we give to Him. Our motives for giving. Be honest with them. That every time we, we, we are put in a position to help someone or give, we automatically think, how am I going to get ahead of this? How am I going to be recognized? No, it's spontaneous. And understand, just as our Savior Jesus Christ ministering on this earth, a lot of times we serve and we give, it will never be recognized. But God recognizes it. And that's what should count. Amen. Not what other people think, what God thinks. And when you have that mentality, then you become a great witness for God because you are living out your faith. This church has been blessed greatly. God has put fun in this church. And sometimes we have to step out of faith and be generous and trust that God will be Because it's very easy to just sit and do nothing. Sometimes we're called to be generous with faith and trust that what we give and how we give and it's the right motives that God will work mightily. You see, true generosity is free from hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is always linked to insincerity. So that brings me to the third point that I'm going to make to you this morning. And that is insincerity will bring God's judgment. Insincerity, dishonesty, when you lie to God, when you're lying about how you give, what you give, understand God will deal with it at His own time. We will answer for the way that we have acted, the decisions we made. Verse 5, Acts 5, notice what happens. Peter says, you're not lying to men, but lie to God. In verse 5 it says this, when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Now I'm not telling you that when the offering plate is passed next Sunday, that if you do not give more than what you are, God will smite you dead. Maybe, I don't know. I'm just teasing, kind of. But understand this. Just like that. I mean, there's no thing about what you did or a slap on the wrist. God killed this man. As a result, for lying to God, it was much more than giving. It was lying to God. As we read on in verse 7, here comes his wife, and I don't know what she was doing in a three-hour span, but three hours later, she comes and she thinks it's about time I get a little bit of recognition. What happens? Boom! She gets smote as well. What happens in this case to Ananias and Sapphira? Show us as believers this morning how much God hates hypocritical and insincere Christianity. God hates it. We as believers are called to hate what God hates. And we need to be genuine and pure and true in the motives of giving and how we give and what we've been giving to God. Peter asked the fire and say, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for your land? What is interesting here is that this wife had a chance to make things right. I think Peter gives her an opportunity to repent of her sins 
and, 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 and confess, but much like her husband, she allows the praise of men, the desire to, to, to have that praise lavish, that sin, to smear her conscience. And she decides to continue the lie. James chapter 1, verses 13 to 15 give us the progression of sin. It says, when lust conceives, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Understand, the initial sin is giving into the temptation. For then it was the praise of men. For others, who knows what the motives may be. But when we are not giving genuinely a servant of the Lord, and we have another ulterior motive than to bring God glory, than for it to be lavished on us rather than Him, understand the consequences are severe. It will lead to death. Though not physically at some point, it chips away at a spiritual. So fire at the same thing as your husband. I love Acts 5, not only because it's just a brutally honest story that maybe you don't get here hear her preached a lot, but many people today will tell you, you know, the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament. We want to separate God. God of the Old Testament, he's mean. Kills all those people full of wrath. Well, God of the New Testament, full of love. He's a big hug. I like that God. Understand this. God of the Old Testament is God of the New Testament. There has not been a change, you see. And I love when people say, oh, Old Testament, all the people that were smitten. We think of the, the example John Roberts gave me an offering when you think of the Nadia and Abihu, when you think of those people killed. Read Acts 5. Read Revelation. When the time comes, the faith will be separated from the unfaithful. And we all will face the consequences of our action. God is a God of love, folks. But God cannot sit back and tolerate blatant sin. He certainly cannot tolerate when his people are insincere and hypocritical in the way they live their life. Not just giving, but it branches off the, the, the way we operate daily. Hold your place and turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. Sometimes this church as a whole, we're going to step out in faith and we're going to make a purchase or we're going to do things and maybe it doesn't turn out the way we'd like it to. So we have to evaluate. Well, next time we need to be more prayerful. We all, as a whole body of believers, every one of us, need to be prayerful about what is taking place. Actually care about what's going on. And understand, we want to further His kingdom and bring glory to God. And sometimes we're going to get jaded. But we seek God, we trust in Him and know that when our heart is right, He will always bring blessing from it. But individually as well, we need to understand in our giving, our heart needs to be in the right place. Because when we begin focusing on what we're holding back and what we have and how much we can give and not being honest with the amount then, we begin to do just what the Pharisees did. Matthew 23, verse 23, notice what Christ says about this hypocrisy. He says, Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind gods. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. We can be so pious in what we give. And with the wrong attitude and the wrong motives, we end up neglecting God's word. And we neglect on the way we are truly called to give as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you read on in that same chapter in Matthew, Christ says very clearly, how will you escape being condemned to hell? So in Acts 5, it says, great fear struck the people inside and outside the church. At verse 11. And I think... As, as we begin bringing this message to a close, God's dealing with Ananias and Sapphira should cause us to take great heed to how we give. The giving in our life. And really be honest in our hearts as to how and, and, and why and the what of giving. Because we need to be honest with our Lord. Because you can't fool him. He will always call our blood. I read J.W. McGarvey earlier, and I, I, I want to quote something from him because he says it a lot better than I can, and probably a lot nicer than I'd like to. He says this, 
Every time a member of the church in the present day makes exaggerated statements of the amount he is giving or understates the amount of his wealth in order to make out a degree of liberality beyond what is real, he is guilty of the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. And if all such were dropped dead in their tracks, there would be a thinning of the ranks in some places. All who are tempted to act thus should be faithfully notified that the same God who punished Ananias and Sapphira on the spot will not fail to punish in his own time and place, all who imitate them. The same fate awaits anyone. The same fate of Ananias and Sapphira to anyone who seeks to be dishonest with God concerning their giving. Folks, stop with the hypocrisy. Stop being insincere in the way you live your life. Because understand, if we're not honest with God, He is always going to call our blood. And there are serious consequences when we lie to God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you and my prayer for all of us in this room that, that we are honest in our lives. That as he who says our heart is laid bare, you know our thoughts, our motives, you know everything. We can't hide anything from you. So it's about time we begin to be honest with you and come clean and evaluate the way we've been living our lives, especially the way we've been giving to you. How we've been giving. What have we been giving? What have we not been giving that we should? Are we holy back? This morning, if anything, from this passage, you will always call our bluff. We cannot lie to you. And when we attempt to lie to you, there will be serious consequences. Father, when we think of the examples of giving, may that carry over in every other area of our life as we seek to be honest with you. And may we seek to be true, genuine servants of you. And if there's anyone in this room, Father, who has not made a decision to make you a part of their life, then may they start being honest this morning and know that they have for you and make that decision. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. As we sing our invitation hymn this morning, Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb? It is a very simple question. I hope and pray if you're here, you have been. And if you haven't, understand there are great consequences for it. That we have to answer for every decision we make, and there's no greater decision than the decision we make for Jesus Christ. But this church, and not just as a whole, but every one of us individually, challenge yourselves. As the play is being passed around, it is not a matter of trying to twist your arm to give more. No, what I want you to do this morning, what I hope you get from this message, is just evaluate how you're giving now. Where your heart is when you give. Because when you have a right heart, God will work great with you in your life. And God will work great with you. Whatever need you have this morning, will you please come as we stand on our end of the position?
Baptistry, we will sing, Now I Belong to Jesus. That's page 501. And we'll sing, Now You Belong to Jesus, page 501.